Welcome to First Steps to Al-Anon Recovery from Al-Anon Family Groups. Today we are pleased to have with us Dr. Robert Hubner, who is Director of the Division of Treatment and Recovery Research at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, or the NIAAA. Dr. Hubner is here with us to talk about current research on the treatment options for alcohol use disorders, including alcohol abuse and alcoholism, as they pertain to the drinker and to the drinker's family members and friends. The NIAAA is one of the 27 institutes and centers that comprise the National Institutes of Health, which is a part of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. The NIAAA supports and conducts research on the impact of alcohol use on human health and well-being. It is the leading funder of alcohol research in the world. Dr. Hubner, thank you for joining us today. It's very nice to be with you, and if I may, I'd just like to say that NIAAA really appreciates the longstanding relationship we've had with Al-Anon over the years, and we especially appreciate your active participation in our National Advisory Council meetings. We benefit from your input and perspective on the complex issues surrounding the prevention and treatment of alcohol use disorders. You know, these disorders don't occur in a vacuum. They clearly impact family, relatives, and friends of the drinker, and we appreciate your perspective on this issue. Well, thank you very much. We are happy to attend and to stay current on the research that's going on in the field. Dr. Hubner, what does the current research show are the benefits to attending Al-Anon meetings for those affected by someone else's problem drinking? It's an excellent question. There is a growing body of research, much of which was funded by NIAAA, that addresses the impact of mutual help in general and Al-Anon in particular. Specifically, our researchers have addressed why people seek out Al-Anon in the first place and uh, looked at the potential benefits to the concerned other family member or relative of participating in Al-Anon meetings. Our studies have found that people who are in relationships with individuals uh, as a family member or friend with an alcohol use disorder seek Al-Anon because they are drawn to the idea of a disease concept of alcohol use disorders. They like the format and accessibility of Al-Anon meetings and, of course, it's commitment to anonymity. They also believe that it's effective, and perhaps most important, Al-Anon provides social support and peer advice that is very attractive to potential participants. This parallels the research on the benefits of mutual help or social support groups for people with family members who have other diseases such as cancer or multiple sclerosis. So there's a growing body of research on that regard. When looking at the benefits of Al-Anon for family members, research on the potential therapeutic benefits of Al-Anon has shown that attending meetings is a good thing. It can bolster coping skills, reduce vulnerability to everyday stressors that we all face. It can also lead to reductions in family conflict and increase satisfaction with relationships. And finally, it can increase uh, self-esteem, which is always a challenging issue when living or being a part of a family system that has a person with alcohol use disorders. Just to mention some specific studies, in fact, I want to compliment Al-Anon on its recent membership surveys. They generally corroborate these research findings. People who attended Al-Anon meetings are reported a reduction in negative emotions, less anxiety, and less disappointment. In addition, Al-Anon members reported clear improvements in daily functioning, such as an increased ability to concentrate, better able to balance work and home commitments, and less procrastination. So the benefits, I think, are pretty clear. It's important to keep in mind that there are methodological limitations in any research study and in membership surveys, and we need to do more research. But I think the general pattern of evidence suggests a real and genuine benefit to participation in Al-Anon meetings. And we believe at IAAA that it represents a great option for family or friends of people with alcohol use disorders. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you for telling us about some of that current research. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us about current research showing benefits to the drinker when their family or friends attend Al-Anon? Sure, sure, it's a good question. On this issue, there are fewer studies, 
but there are some hints in one NIAAA-supported survey of Al-Anon members that suggests Al-Anon membership can mean positive changes, either direct or indirect, in the behavior of the drinker in the family. To get at this question, responses from long-term Al-Anon members were compared to newcomers to Al-Anon. Their responses to questions about the drinker in their lives appeared to differ in a couple of important ways, suggesting that participating in Al-Anon meetings can influence a person in the family that is experiencing problems with alcohol first. Long-term stable members of Al-Anon report far fewer problems with driving under the influence by their significant others. That's important because that's a huge uh, national problem than newcomer members. So there's a big difference there. Second, longer-term members of Al-Anon are more likely to report the drinkers in their lives have sought and received some kind of help for their drinking, either professional help via an outpatient program, for example, or mutual help groups like AA. Again, it's important to qualify these findings as suggestive future research is needed to kind of pin down that causal relationship between non attendance and downstream changes in drinking behavior. But these are hints that, again, if a family member participates in Al-Anon, it will have either direct or indirect effects on their significant other. Related to this question, I'd like to go on here, is that it is important for significant others to play a role in treatment if the family or friend of someone with AUD has decided to seek help and the family member is comfortable with lending a hand in that. Research has consistently shown that family member involvement in supporting treatment is critical to long-term success, be that helping taking medications on schedule, and I'll talk a bit about those later, encouraging the drinker to do their homework that they've been assigned in treatment, or actively supporting abstinence. All these things can make a huge, huge difference in treatment outcome for the drinker. In fact, I should mention that um, a number of years ago, NIAAA supported a very large complicated clinical trial of a variety of treatment approaches, both medications and behavioral interventions. And the major behavioral intervention was called combined behavioral intervention. This was really an amazing compilation of the best elements of all the behavioral interventions that are available. But one of the key elements of that was including the family member in the treatment process, if they were ready and willing to do so and it was associated with better outcomes. I think there can be some clear benefits to the drinker of an Al-Anon member participating in Al-Anon, and if they choose, if they're in a place where they're comfortable, they can play a big role in the drinker's recovery process. Thank you. Dr. Huber, how significant is the problem of denial in preventing a person who's suffering from the disease of alcoholism and those affected by a drinker from getting help? Yeah, we frame this issue in terms of identifying the factors that initiate and maintain behavior change. Behavior change, I think everyone is aware, is a complicated process, and it's thought to follow five discrete stages, pre-contemplation, contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. In the pre-contemplation stage, a person doesn't acknowledge that change needs to happen. In the contemplation stage, a person acknowledges there's an issue, but they're not sure they are ready or want to change. In the preparation stage, a person gets ready to change. And finally, in the action stage, the behavior actually changes. And in the fifth stage, maintenance, one maintains the changes that have been made. These stages of change might well describe the decision process a family member has when considering attending an Al-Anon meeting, because that represents a pretty significant behavior change. The main point here is that changing behavior does not happen in a single step, and it's very important to know what stage of change a person is in before seeking to encourage or support that behavior change. And motivational interviewing is one technique that's been shown to increase the probability that a person moves from the pre-contemplation stage to the contemplation stage and action stage. Motivational interviewing is an evidence-based behavioral intervention. It's really a counseling technique that seeks to marshal an individual's internal motivation to change by asking questions in a strategic way. For example, What is not good about drinking and what do you like about drinking? How might you like things to be different? If you decide to quit, how would you do it? Those kinds of questions 
asked in a fairly empathic and non-judgmental style can help create an ambivalence within the drinker that eventually will lead them to think a little more seriously about changing. So that's how we look at the issue of denial. It's really about moving someone from the pre-contemplation stage to the contemplation stage. And there are techniques out there that can facilitate that. That is really helpful information for hopefully reaching out to people who could use some help. So thank Mm -hmm. you very much. Okay, what is the best course of action for someone suffering from the effects of someone else's drinking? Sure. The research on this issue suggests that someone suffering from the effects of someone else's drinking could consider one of two approaches, obviously. One is approaching the issue. The other is avoiding the problem. And examples of the former would be to talk about it with friends and family, of course, attending Al-Anon meetings, learning some evidence-based coping skills, and relaxation and mindfulness skills. Examples of avoidance would be, of course, trying not to think about the problem, keeping feelings on the issue bottled up, and that typically leads to the downstream consequences of taking upset feelings out on others. I think it's important to point out there are multiple pathways to approaching the problem of a family member or friends drinking. Of course, Al-Anon is one of the important pathways here, but I'd encourage family members to consider others as well. For example, talking to primary care physicians that are competent to discuss alcohol issues, faith leaders, ministers, priests, and the rabbis, and lastly, mental health professionals. There are other, I think, viable approaches to beginning the process of seeking some help for the difficult issues raised by a family member's drinking. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, What does the family member of an alcoholic need to know about treatment options that are currently available for the drinker? Sure. I think it's important to know that medical research, most of which has been supported by NIH and the NIAAA over the last 20 years, has yielded a number of evidence-based treatments for people with alcohol problems. And this, in turn, I think could give both family members and drinkers hope. First of all, Many people are not aware that there are three FDA-approved medications available for the treatment of alcohol use disorders. Disulfiram, or the trade name is Antabuse, it's the first one. Naltrexone is the second, and the third is Acamprosate. Use of these medications in combination with some form of behavioral treatment really work for many people. And NIAAA is devoting a lot of energy toward finding new medications and figuring out for whom these medications work best. That's a big initiative here at the NIH is precision medicine. So we want to find the medication that works best for each individual. So that's the main thing. There are a number of very important medications available, and these can be prescribed by one's primary care doctor. Other effective treatments include behavioral couples therapy, and family therapy, again, for family members who are at a place in the process of dealing with their significant other's drinking where they want to partner with their spouse or friend in seeking help and recovery. These evidence-based therapies focus on improving the dynamics of relationships, such as communication skills and problem-solving skills and the like. These relationship-focused therapies seem like a good fit given the data from this member survey we talked about a moment ago that showed that most participants in Al-Anon are indeed in long-term relationships and report improvement of that long-term relationship as an important goal. Another evidence-based option funded by an IAAA is an approach called Community Reinforcement and Family Training, or CRAFT for short. This has been around for a long time, and the key idea behind this approach is that family members can, again, if they choose, make a difference in the drinker's path to recovery, and it teaches them how to leverage their considerable social influence to help drinkers change. Family members that undertake this craft training can, for example, learn to provide positive reinforcement for abstinence and avoid inadvertently reinforcing a loved one's alcohol or other drug use. In addition, craft teaches people to keep an eye out for windows of opportunity or windows of readiness, going back to the stages of change idea. It's important to kind of be aware of when those happen and when readiness to change happens, or it looks like readiness to change is about to happen, one can link the drinker up with help straight away. 
These evidence-based approaches are nicely summarized in a new NIAAA publication I want to mention called Treatment for Alcohol Problems, Finding and Getting Help. And I should note that in that publication, we do highlight contact information for Al-Anon for family members as well. One more thing, if you don't mind, I'll mention one other publication. I recommend this to all Al-Anon members. It's called Rethinking Drinking. It provides, again, research-based general information about what constitutes a problem. This is a question that a lot of people have. When do I know my family member has a problem? And this lays out some important information on how to kind of assess that. It also lays out the risks associated with drinking too much and some suggestions for those who want to reduce their drinking. It's also on the NIAAA website, which has a number of features, such as a calorie counter, which usually surprises a lot of people when they find out how many calories are involved in a typical drink. So the bottom line here is there are multiple treatment options available by medical research and that these options work for people that stick with them. Dr. Huebner, thank you for talking with us today about current research on the treatment options for alcohol use disorders as they pertain to the drinker and to the drinker's family members and friends. And thank you, everyone, for listening to First Steps to Al-Anon Recovery. You are welcome to listen to any of the Al-Anon Family Group podcasts at www.alanon.org. You are also welcome to attend a face-to-face meeting of Al-Anon Family Groups in your own community by clicking on How to Find a Meeting or by calling one 888 4 That's one 888 Thank you for listening to First Steps to Al-Anon.